Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to briefly discuss the qualities that an ideal IV anesthetic agent would have and why, and introduce the current IV anesthetics used, each of which will be discussed in their own videos to come. Let's get started. So first, there are two general bodies that we need to look at when describing the qualities of an IV anesthetic, and those are the pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic qualities. And then we also have to take a look at our physiochemical properties. So we need to define these and our pharmacodynamics, these refer to the drugs effect on the body. So these include things like the mechanism of action and what they end up actively doing to the human physiology. And I just remember this because D in drugs comes first. I don't know. It's just kind of the way it sticks for me. And then we have our pharmacokinetics. And if the dynamics is the drug's effect on the body, the kinetics is the body's effect on the drug. These would be things like how the body metabolizes it, how it becomes distributed, things like that. Now on the other side, we have to look at our physiochemical properties, and these are the physical and chemical makeups of the drug. Physical and chemical makeup. So these are like the structure and how they interact. And so it's important that we look at both of these two subclasses in order to account when describing our ideal agents. So first we're gonna take a look at the pharmacodynamic and kinetic properties. And before we get started, I'm going to urge everyone, as I try to in all of my videos, to remember to start getting into a habit of thinking of things in relatable real world context and try to get out of the box of the textbook of medicine. So when we talk about these characteristics, I'm always going to relate it back to what I perceive as being the, oh yeah, of course, that's what I would want, mentality, as opposed to just listing things off of a textbook. So on to pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, and we're just going to draw a line here to separate. So the first thing we want is hypnosis and amnesia. So these are both originally Greek terms, hypnos meaning to sleep, and that seems pretty obvious. We want our drugs to put our patients to sleep, and amnesia from Greek because we want our patients to forget everything sleep and forget. I'm sure if any of you had your chest cracked open or your uterus taken out, you would not want to be awake or remember any of that either. Second is we want something that's rapid onset and offset, meaning titratable. This means the drug gets into the body quickly, but then is metabolized into its inactive metabolites quickly. And this is important because it makes the drug able to be controlled, meaning that depending on our dosing, we can easily either put the patient to sleep or wake them back up at a moment's notice. Next, we want our drugs to maintain hemodynamic stability. In this case, we don't want to cause major changes to our patient's cardiovascular status or their respiratory status. Something we see today with a lot of our induction agents is that they can cause severe vasodilation. That leads to bouts of hypotension, which many of you, if you're anesthesia residents, have seen in the operating room, a big bolus of propofol can cause major drops in blood pressure. They can also cause apnea with high enough doses or with patients that are susceptible. And both of these can be severely detrimental, say in a patient that you can't guarantee that you can secure an airway in, 
or a patient who's hemodynamically tenuous or may have history of strokes or heart attacks where dropping their pressure could have major implications. So we want our drugs to maintain a nice hemodynamically stable patient. Four is we want to avoid allergic reactions and hypersensitivity reactions. And this is pretty hopefully obvious that you wouldn't want a patient going into anaphylaxis or having a high risk of anaphylaxis in going to sleep as that in and of itself could be deadly. So we're also looking for some beneficial effects. We want some good things to come from our induction anesthetic as well, our IV drug. And ideally, these agents would be analgesic in nature. And this would be great because it would mean less adjunct pain medications. Sometimes people forget that just because the patient is asleep doesn't mean that they don't feel pain and that their body doesn't recognize pain. Six, drugs that are anti-emetic. So they help with nausea and vomiting. And then ideally we would be able to have something that was neuro and cardiac protective. So in case of bouts of hypoxia to any of these organs, you it diminishes the risk to some degree. And so if you kind of look at this list, like I said before, it's kind of obvious things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but I want to keep you from reading out of a textbook. And obviously you want your patient asleep and forgetting everything. You want the drug to go on quickly, come off quickly, so you can get in and out of the operating room or wherever you have to be. You want to maintain hemodynamic stability because you never want your patient unstable if you can help it. You don't want any allergic and hypersensitive reactions. And ideally, if it were analgesic, antiemetic, neuro and cardioprotective would also be extremely beneficial. We're going to take a quick look now at the physiochemical properties that we'd like to see in our IV agents, starting with water solubility. And it seems silly, but you're actually going to encounter quite a number of medications that precipitate pretty easily. Mannitol is a good example if you've ever seen bags with crystals in them. It is important that whatever the agent is actually either comes in an aqueous solution that can be given to the patient intravenously, or it can be reconstituted into one, like vecuronium or cefazolin, which sometimes can be harder than it seems in the cases of vancomycin and dantrolene, which are actually very hard to mix. And in the case of dantrolene, if you're giving it emergently and it's not as water-soluble, it can cause issues. Next, we want them to be non-irritating slash non-painful. And as you all know, many of our drugs, such as propofol, etomidate, they can burn on injection. And this can be of the because of the acidic or basic nature of some of these medications. So being able to smoothly induce someone with a medication that doesn't cause further pain, increase their sympathetic response would be ideal. Finally, we would want a drug that's inexpensive and easily manufactured. I feel as though it goes without saying that if a drug was extraordinarily expensive and couldn't be used on a regular basis in the operating room, if it had all of these qualities, it wouldn't be much good to most practitioners. In that same idea, sometimes less of a drug is more, and if you can get the same effect from a smaller amount of drug, meaning that you only have to use a little bit, it can oftentimes be beneficial for the patient, not just for cost, but for the actual giving the medication to the person and the effects it may have on the body. So that's it, short and sweet, the ideal IV anesthetic rolled up into this one page. I do hope after going through the list, these things don't come as a surprise to anyone. But this way, if someone in the future, such as an attending or medical student, asks you what makes a good IV anesthetic rather than feeling the need to memorize and rattle off a list, we can just think about what maybe not so obvious things we would want. The other way, is to think of the agents we have and use and what they do well and then maybe what they don't do so well and what they wish we did better as a way to easily conceptualize this without feeling the need to memorize it. That's all for our, our introduction to ideal anesthetics. Check in for the next videos about our specific IV anesthetic agents. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact us. Otherwise, tune in for the next video.